Hi, my name is Paul Doherty, and I'm here to talk to you about using GIS for search and rescue. I've spent several years of my life studying this problem, and I'm very passionate about it. You're probably wondering, what does GIS have to do with search and rescue? Search and rescue, or SAR, is an inherently spatial problem. In SAR, there are four phases. First, we need to locate the victim. Then we need to access the victim once they're found. We need to stabilize the victim so they can be transported to safety. And then we need to transport the victim. And this route may not be the same that we use to access them. Within each of these phases, you'll find maps, or at the very least, mental maps used as part of the process. Another thing to consider is how spatial analysis can be used for prevention, known as PSAR. But for now, let's talk about the search component. When someone goes missing, it truly is an emergency. The longer they're missing, the less likely it is that they'll survive the environmental conditions, trauma, or medical issues that they're facing. For most teams, when a search is launched, several reflex tests are considered and spatial questions are asked. Where was the person last known to be? What direction were they headed in? What are some of the hazards we face in the area? Who might have seen this person before they ran into trouble, and where were they? Where have we already searched? And most importantly, where is the person most likely to be right now? In general, search managers are using paper maps, transparencies, markers, and whatever tools they have at their disposal. And this will work 95% of the time, as many missing persons are found very soon after they're reported missing. However, when the search is unsuccessful in those first 24 hours, these techniques become problematic. Data management becomes an issue, and when gut instincts do not yield a successful find, spatial analysis becomes an indispensable tool. Two examples of spatial analyses would be using distance and time-based spatial analysis techniques. The first is the statistical. It's a multi-ring buffer based on historic incident data. This technique uses historical data from a large international search and rescue database created by Robert Kester. It summarizes the distance at which people are found from where they're last known to be. It takes into account the behavior and the activity of the missing subject. The distance used for these analyses, however, is as the crow flies, and we have found evidence that a local summary works better than a global summary. The second is the theoretical model. This is a travel cost model based on the terrain and scenario information. This technique is newer and relies more on the principles of physics. Terrain simply affects how quickly someone can move through the landscape. They can move more quickly on flat or gentle downslope and faster on trails versus off. However, this model assumes a constant walking speed and really relies on your investigation of what the missing person's behavior might have been. For instance, will they just stay put or will they wander? Our research concluded that combining both of these techniques may provide the best balance between the statistical and theoretical analyses. More research needs to be done to test other models as well. Spatial analysis offers promising techniques for solving search and rescue problems. I hope you found this interesting, and if you want to help, here's how to get started. First, continue learning about spatial analysis. Second, find out about the GIS Corps. The GIS Corps is a nonprofit organization, and they're seeking to help GIS professionals and people who are interested in GIS connect with search and rescue teams. And finally, find your local SAR team and ask them if they need your help. They may need help with spatial analyses or simpler things like just plotting the most recent trail network.